Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Mawson, and I'd like to welcome you to this seminar on making people and places better. I sit as a crossbench peer in the House of Lords, and I've spent over 35 years working with local people and social entrepreneurs to help create sustainable change in communities. And now to introduce our panelists. It's a really great pleasure to introduce Lord Nigel Crisp, a fellow peer and leading commentator and advisor on health policy, both nationally and globally. Nigel was the chief executive of the NHS from, two, from 2000 to 2006 and has devoted his career and considerable intellect to developing policies that improve health and well-being. He's also a special advisor to Well North Enterprises. In his latest book, Health is Made at Home, hospitals are for repairs, Nigel challenges the public to set aside normal assumptions. He says, take off your traditional NHS spectacles to see the world differently and take more personal control of your own health. Joining him on our panel are two pioneering architects and a highly respected NHS leader. Amir Hussain is an ambitious young architect with dynamic new ideas founder of Yemi Architects based in Bradford. His team's core philosophy is that architecture should tell a story, respect a past and inspire a future. Amir will share his experience of working with Well North Enterprises on the Squire Lane project in the Girlington neighborhood of Bradford, where he grew up. Susan Rankin is an experienced and respected NHS leader is dedicated to bringing better health to the people of Northwest Surrey. As the Chief Executive of Ashford and St. Peter's Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust, she leads the team, which is using a major redevelopment program to transform the hospital into an anchor NHS organization. Suzanne will outline the work we are doing together and make this vision a reality in Northwest Surrey. Suzanne returns today after being seconded to the cabinet office where she has been supporting the health secretary Matt Hancock with the COVID track and trace system. Chris Liddle is our fourth eminent panelist, chairman of HLM Architects and one of the leading voices in the debate around creating more innovative health environments. His practice has designed hospitals and healthcare facilities across the country, which are also catalysts for social integration and economic improvement. Chris's practice built the Leadership Centre in Shrivenham, bringing together the Army, Navy and Air Force in one integrated building. Before handing over to our presenters, I'd like to briefly outline the reason behind bringing them all together today. If we are to improve the health of our population, we need to challenge the traditional top-down centralized approach to health and well-being. Much of the data shows that this approach is not delivering the change that's needed. In fact, the recent report by Sir Michael Marmot indicated that health inequalities are widening across the country in spite of massive investment in health infrastructure, screening and other prevention programs. We clearly need a radically different approach to delivering a healthier future for people, particularly in some of our most challenged communities. My own experience over 35 years is that bringing together the public sector, business partners and social entrepreneurs is the only way to generate sustainable change across communities. I always say we are the environments we live, work and play in. We need to take really seriously, in my experience, having built quite a new bu few buildings in my life, the designed environment and the built environment, the places we build and create. create. Working first with the Bromley by Bow Centre, then Well North and Well North Enterprises, I've seen the transformation projects work best when local people are actively involved in creating the change they want to see. And that includes addressing the underlying causes of ill health poverty, unemployment, poor housing, addiction and debt. All the things that a visit to the GP or A&E won't fix. We've got a once in a generation opportunity in this new COVID world for completely rethink on how we approach health and well-being. Today, we're tackling just one important element of this huge project, linking health and the built environment more effectively. I'd now like to hand over to Nigel Crisp to share your perspective, Nigel. Good to have you with us. 
Thank you very much indeed, Andrew, and congratulations to you and to the organizers for this great event. Um, and it's great to hear about a bit about what's going on in Surrey, and I'm looking forward to hearing more later on. Let me start, however, by recognizing just how tough it is for people working in health and social care and providing public services at the moment for many of the people, perhaps all of you on, on, on this call. Um, it, it's, it's really tough in terms of personally and, and for one's colleagues and, and one's communities. And I know that there have been impacts on mental health and morale, and there must be lots of worries about the future and about how much longer this is gonna go on and winter and everything. So let me start just by congratulating you on what you are doing in keeping these vital services going. But let me also just congratulate you on thinking so positively about the future here, taking the time to be working out what's gonna work for the future and building back better in that sort of cliche we've got to know. Uh, it's brilliant. And to see so many people from different parts of Surrey life on this call, on this video, is really impressive. Now, as Andrew said, I was Chief Executive of the NHS and Permanent Secretary of the Department of Health. Uh, and as I normally say at this stage, I'm now in recovery. Um, I, I've spent some part of that recovery working in Africa, and I learned to look at the world differently. I actually wrote a book called Turning the World Upside Down, which was about what we can learn from people without our resources, um, but also without our baggage and our history, and who are therefore able to do things differently. And it's still relevant, I think. Uh, and more recently, working a bit more in the UK, I've been thinking much more about what the, the role of people outside the health system in creating health, and not just creating it for themselves, but creating it for their communities and so on. Made me take my NHS spectacles off, uh, as Andrew said. Led me to write this book, Health is Made at Home, Hospitals are for Repairs. Uh, it's a saying from a, a Ugandan friend, Professor Francis Omazwa, who was head of the Ugandan Health Service. Actually, you know, Andrew, looking at this, I could have called the book Making Places and People Better. So mm. title. I began the book long before the, the pandemic hit us. I wanted to celebrate the thousands of people, such as teachers, employers, community leaders, architects, and entrepreneurs, who are not health professionals, but who are actively improving health and well-being. And I wanted to understand what they were doing and understand what it meant for the future. And the pandemics reinforced the importance of this whole approach and shown us very clearly the different roles played by the NHS, by government, and by each of us as citizens and members of society. Now, the NHS, as I've said, has been fighting for our lives for the last few weeks and months, throwing all its resources at the pandemic. Millions of health and care workers have been magnificent, rising to the occasion with bravery and skill. And it's shown us that we need to invest more in the health system. Government has had a crucial role to play, and I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, we all know that it's uh, uh, had many things that it, it could do, but now is not the moment for us to be discussing how effectively that's been done, but there will certainly be some lessons to learn for the future. But it's been up to us, actually, the general public, how far and how fast the virus spreads. Our behaviour has mattered. Millions have volunteered to help. They've kept community and voluntary activity going or simply looked after their neighbours. Millions more have kept the vital non-health emergency and other services running in agriculture, retail, delivery, power, transport, finance, rubbish collection, and so much more. So we've all had our part to play. And looking forward, there's going to continue to be a vital role for all of us when the pandemic is over or contained or become endemic rather than pandemic, because the NHS can't do everything by itself. As Andrew's already said, the NHS can't deal with many of today's major health problems such as loneliness, stress, obesity, poverty and addictions. It can only react, and in the words of my book, doing the repairs rather than addressing the underlying causes. But there are people all over the country who are tackling these causes in their home, workplaces and communities. The leaders and pioneers. People like the Berkshire teachers working with children excluded from school. The unemployed men in Salford improving their community. The bankers tackling mental health in the city and many others. And they're opening up new ideas to me about health creation and quality of life and showing us what they mean in practice. And they're not waiting for government or health professionals to tell them what to do. They're taking the initiative and leading. They're not just preventing disease, but they're creating health. And it's important to point out these are not merely developments on what's already happening, tweaks to the system. They're not about 
clinicians starting to prescribe healthy activities as well as medicines, nor about the NHS beginning to actively pursue prevention and promotion, nor are they about engaging the public. All these things are great, but this is actually something, do it, something different. They, th those systems all keep people dependent on the system and the professional, business as usual. And what I mean by health, uh, health creation, and, and let me say, I see health now in terms of three activities. Health services, critical and vital, of course. Prevention, particularly prevention of individual diseases, such as diabetes and, and tackling obesity or tackling a heart or, or cancers, but also creation. And I think health creating, which is about the causes of health, not about the causes of ill health, which is what prevention is dealing with, um, I see this as critical, as a th critical third part of this trio of uh, set of activities. Um, and what I mean by creating health is creating the conditions for people to be healthy and helping them to be so. It's what good parents do, it's what good teachers do, it's what good schools do. Um, uh, and it's what good community leaders do. They help create independent, confident, healthy, resilient individuals for the future and good citizens. And of course, there's history here. This isn't new. There's a, the great tradition of salutogenesis, which has been around for some years. And going back to the ancient Greeks, both Aristotle and Plato talked about eudaimonia, uh, by which it's normally translated as human flourishing. And I think human flourishing is what health creation is about. If we think about the World Health Organization definition of health, it's about physical, mental, and social well-being, all three of those. And I think COVID has brought the social aspect of that into the frame and, and into focus. And the science here too, as people in the audience will know, actually being in a green environment produces physiological changes which have benefit for us uh, and, and being in company and having good relationships and so on actually have positive benefits that we can point to. Let me just give you a, a few examples before finishing. Firstly, let me take you to Skelmersdale and to the sewing rooms uh, a, a smart uh, entrepreneurial lady there uh, decided that she wanted to set up a social business which would benefit lonely women in the area. She set up the sewing rooms which brought women together. Um, she set up as a commercial, as a social business, so it's trading for social benefit, so it's actually trading. Um, it, it now runs something called the Silver Sewers, which is bringing older women together. It's been running programs with refugees locally. Um, and been a source of building and developing in the community. And most recently, of course, they've been sewing um, protective, personal protective equipment, masks, and so on. Let me take you to Yorkshire, to uh, uh, Todd Morden, um, where another woman set up Incredible Edible, which is actually a program whereby people are um, growing vegetables in public places. She set them up uh, as, as propaganda gardens. People came and talked to her about it, that she and her colleagues. Um, they started to bring the community together. They now run uh, um, food festivals. They, they, they teach cooking. They, um, they're supporting local businesses. And there are now 150 groups around the country. Or take you to Cornwall and Camborne, where a policeman was fed up with chasing young people for uh, minor misdemeanors and vandalism, um, and instead started to work with them. And over the last 14 years, they set up a dance school which has now had 2,000 children, young people, uh, coming through it over the years. Um, uh, and has really, and, and it's now run by the young people themselves. They're the trustees of another social enterprise. Um, and it's had clear effects on the mental and social well-being of those young people, as well as on crime rates in Camborne or in a hospital. Horatio's Garden, um, the, the uh, GP who who set up a, a, a garden in memory of her son for spinal injuries um, patients, um, which allowed them to escape from the clinical environment, to feel alive and well within the garden. And that's now developing in every spinal injuries unit around the country. So these are all examples. And the first three had nothing to do with the NHS, but they were all ambitious and they all um, affected positively people's health and well-being. All these people, it seems to me, are operating on a sort of different parameter from the way we, we operate in the NHS. Different relationships, different behaviours. Um, key is relationships. Relationships rather than systems. Systems are important, but actually relationships is what gets things done because you know people and they, they focus on building relationships. 
they're vision led rather than plan led. And that means they learn by doing and they're entrepreneurial. And they focus on meaning and purpose rather than just on processes. And a whole range of other issues that distinguish their behavior uh, and make it hard sometimes for the professionals to work with them. But on the other hand, they also make them distinctive uh, uh, and important for the future. So I think there's a great range of people out there for us from within the health system to be working with and within local government and within uh, the other parts of the NHS and government. And we need to recognize what's happening. We need to work with them on their terms and not just on ours. It's not top down engagement, it's working with them. So finally, let me congratulate you all for what you're doing here and for coming together so effectively in Surrey. And, and uh, well, as I was looking at this, I was reflecting what's happening in Surrey? Because actually over the last month, I've been in contact with, or a bit longer than a month, Dr. Gillian Oro, who I think may be on the call, who's a, who's a GP in Hawley. And she and colleagues have set up Healthy Hawley, which is bringing together people right throughout the community around this topic of health creating, creating health, not just health services or prevention, but actually positively creating health. And I've recently been, been uh, done a video, in fact, with um, uh, Fiona, Fiona Edwards and Surrey and Borders Trust, where I know they're tackling some of the big social impacts that have come out of COVID with a particular emphasis on working with people from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities and they're developing nursing. So it seems to me there's a great deal happening in Surrey. I don't know why, perhaps I'm gonna to learn today uh, what's in the water or, or, or whatever as to why you are really, I think, leading the way on a lot of this. And I'm gonna be really interested to hear what more you do, or what hear from you today, what you're doing and hear what more you're gonna be doing in the future. Thank you very much. And back to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Nigel, for a really thought provoking overview of your journey and the insights you've gained along the way. And for all the work you've been doing cross party in the Lords, really, to bring many people together around developing a new narrative for the future of health. There's a whole piece of work going on there. And thanks for sharing your new book with us. I'd now like to ask Amir. Um, to share some of the energy and inspiration he's brought to the Squire Lane project in Bradford. Amir brings both an international perspective and a very local focus. And it's certainly been a privilege for me over the last four years to be working with him on a detailed development in Girlington in Bradford, one of the most challenging communities in the city actually, actually where Amir grew up. So he knows it pretty well. Tell us about the built environment, um, Amir, and tell us why buildings can make such a difference in bringing a more joined up community together and breaking free of these ridiculous silos that we're all having today live within and work within, many of which just don't work well. Yeah, thanks very much, Andrew. Um, I have to say, I am somewhat of a newcomer to, to all of this. And um, it really was stemmed, stemmed from a, a, a chance encounter with, with Lord Mawson, um, as I say, four years ago. And I don't think my life has been quite the same since. Um, but, 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 but essentially, I think seeing what had happened in Bromley by Bow was really quite powerful in getting an understanding of how that could be translated into um, the environment that, that, that we had here in Bradford. I'm just going to try and share my screen so hopefully you can see that now. Is that right? Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. So as Andrew says, um, I grew up in, in um, <coughs> a part of Bradford called Girlington, which were, is very challenged. And it's got sort of some really high density, low value, really challenging health and, and, and inequality issues. But it also has another side to it, which was actually quite interesting. And having lived there, it was really this, this juxtaposition between the two that I, I, I saw and thought was actually really powerful. And having read part of the way through Lord Chris's book, I can kind of see where the health creation is happening sort of at a grassroots level. So when we looked at the, at the site and we see it in, in, its, in there, it sort of gives some character photos of, of sort of the juxtaposition between the, the affluence at one side of it and the, and the, and the deprivation at the other. But it was also the fact that we were immediately opposite the hospital and we were right next to things like schools, madrasas, mosques, churches, and a whole wealth of other things that actually were all independently active and, and nothing was integrated. And when we approached the, the, the proposition, I really wanted to try and bring all of those things together. And the proposition started with a simple swimming baths. So the original plan had been just to put a swimming baths there. 
And I knew from my own experience of the place that that would just become another silo. And, and I think it was really about how could we do things that would bring a broader sense of the community with it and how could we could we handle i think the the determinants of health how could we bring about a triggering of change and and how could we create this thing that would become part of community life for us it was really simple in terms of the the idea of about having a, a purpose having a reason to get up in the morning this whole idea of enterprise and using entrepreneurialism which i'll come on to a little bit later and also this idea of social interaction to try and break down the silos and it was really the idea that this building on its own as just a swimming bath would never achieve these broader things so we had to then start looking at how could we start achieving broader ambitions for it when we look at the, the triggering change, we see that there's, there's so many issues that cause people to not make that first initiation of starting to uplift their lives. Once they choose to do that, then there's lots of responsive things that happen. But how do we, how do we present opportunities to people who are not necessarily looking for them to create those triggers? So that was another premise that we wanted to achieve from it. And then when it came to the community, this is where it started getting really, really interesting, because I've just listed some of the things that were going on within the area. And I would say that largely most of them would be invisible to newcomers and they would be invisible when people do master plans of cities and they look at what, what makes up the place. They, they very often miss these things. So Manningham Baths was a failing Edwardian bathhouse, which an entrepreneur bought, converted, made into an integrated women's gym incredibly successful it's now five years old a job we did a few years ago but it's really really worked well um Mumtaz runs various classes and various activities for women in the area when tour de yorkshire came there was a view that asian women don't cycle she got 219 to take part um keelan farm shops is again a farm to fork retailer but none of the people in that really deprived area are using it um the the bazaar model is really interesting because i think this is really emanated from bradford where we've got lots of redundant buildings and people essentially have flexible spaces and they can come and go as they please and they can pop up and do whatever they like and what that does is it creates a different type of entrepreneur it attracts a different type of entrepreneur you've got pop-up chai shops we've then got mosques and madrasas that are heavily involved in obesity and activities and anti-social behavior in this case they actually spent bonfire night protecting a local pub which when you think about muslims drinking and protecting the pub is quite interesting you know but it's that sort of activity that i think has become this whole sort of thing around health creation that you wouldn't ordinarily get to see. So it was a case of how do we bring that together into the, 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 the proposition. The swimming baths itself is what the starting point was, and we knew that it had to do more than that. Um, we wanted to try and use it as an integrative model to try and bring in different aspects of it in a really flexible way. One of them was by bringing in health directly, so acute primary care. And how do we get somebody who sat waiting to see a doctor being exposed to an opportunity to start a business, run an allotment, take on a, 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 a swimming group or say a class and, and so on and so forth. How do we use food as a great unifier? But more than that, how do we do it in a way that allows entrepreneurial activity so that somebody like my mum, who does a fantastic soup, could actually take one of these units, could actually use it as a means of getting to know the community? And could the authenticity of the offer help to attract a consultant working in the hospital, a taxi driver at the end of their shift? And could the setting of it attract teenagers to not hang out in the chicken and chip shops, but to come here instead? And, and so we then sort of looked at, at enterprise and, and sort of trying to, to, to uplift people who were running businesses within the, within the area to achieve greater uh, outcomes. How could we then use that exact same pop-up bazaar model, but for health and beauty? And essentially just give various rooms to anybody, let them do different practices and let them, who does that attract as practitioners? Who does it attract into the building that wouldn't ordinarily come into the building for health and beauty? And how do we help to get them onto a digital platform, help them to grow their business, migrate and repeat it with, with other people? Um, how do we use the allotments and green space? How do we give people an, an entrepreneurial exit for their produce? How do we create digital connections into the community for them to, to, to become engaged and, and, and fulfilled? So when we then came on to the design, that sort of had to sort of try and capture all of this and to try and create adjacencies that if somebody comes in for one thing, how do they get exposed to something else? 
and that's sort of what we ended up with, which and you can, you know, it's not actually intended to be yellow. Um, that was just uh, for, for diagrammatic purposes. Um, but, but the idea was that how do we break down this big monolithic building so it could be different things to different people? How could we create something that when you did come inside, you have this sense of um, occasion, you have this sense of uplifting atmosphere and you could interact with people in a way that you might not otherwise. And how do we create an exterior that is an introduction to the building where you can interact and, and, and enjoy the building without actually even stepping inside it. And, and, and so how did that design come through? So that was essentially the physical realm. We then are working on um, a, a quite a, an important digital side of the business, which is really how do we go beyond the red lines of our boundary and start to really impact the wider area? So we're working on a community app, which essentially is designed to connect real people to real activities and events and assets in the community in real time in a very intuitive way. And what this needed us to do is to map everything in an area. So what we start doing is getting a really comprehensive overview of places. So we did this in three areas and uh, one of the wards in Bradford, Leeds and Harrogate. And you start, just as a headline, you start to see some of the disparities between places and you, you really begin to understand some of the issues. We start monitoring this aspect of the, the overall um, makeup of the place to get an understanding of, of the nature of it. And we then start quantifying everything that goes on in there. And it could be anything from Western Union shops, because there's a lot of refugees who are sending money back, or it could be hair salons that people are hanging out in, in the Kurdish community and so on. But what makes that community work and what's causing the, the movement within the area? And again, you start pulling out some really interesting statistics. In BD5, the seven green spaces. In LS6 in Leeds, there's 61. In Harrogate, there's 50. So you really begin to start seeing some of these things. And what the, the issue is at the moment is all of the, the um, technology that's out there requires the user to initiate the search or initiate the action. And that's a big barrier for a lot of people. So what we're trying to do is take the end event, whether it's a Zumba class, whether it's a pop-up tribute band, or whether it's a, a, a mums and toddlers group, to bring that to the right person at the right time intuitively so that they can see that. And then we're giving them the opportunity to then join up and make connections with other people in their community around specific events and interests. So that's a little diagram showing, this is real data by the way. So as that marker moves through the area, it's highlighting everything within a 500 meter radius in terms of activities that are going on around you. And obviously one, you can see the disparity between different places, but even in the most deprived, there's 41 items of things going on around somebody as they're walking through. How many people are aware of them? How many people actually understand them? How many people can interact with them? And for us, it's about how do we digitally create that, that, that relationship between things? It's all about this going back to this healthy society and it's all about reducing silos. It's about how do we bring together the physical realm and the digital and activities that are happening within trends and so on to, to, to create a different set of outcomes. And then that's our final sort of view of the <clears throat> of the proposition, which is what we're hoping to achieve. And I think that's my time up. Thank Amir, you. that's a fantastic presentation. Plenty of food for thought there. Uh, and I'm sure the audience will want to find out more in the Q&A session um, later. Uh, of course, one of the things we're finding, Amir and I and colleagues in Bradford, is actually the structures of government and the Treasury are holding the city back. They really not meaning to, but preventing these kinds of joined up worlds creating. And this is being created. And, and, and uh, it's this building that um, Amir is telling us about, of course, is directly opposite the hospital, a teaching hospital with five and a half thousand staff in a very poor community. How a building might actually bring together a whole community and maybe hub and spokes transform a whole city. So we have GPs at the moment wanting to put 20,000 patients into that building connecting to what we're doing. So it's a really interesting project in Bradford um, with actually a business logic, by the way, underneath it. Um, just finally to say, Amir is also working on a six and a half acre development in Leicester with some entrepreneurs there applying a similar log logic to some very challenging matters in that city. So let's look at the issues from an NHS perspective. Susan Ranking is helping to shape and deliver a new vision for 21st century healthcare. Um, Susan 
brings a wealth of experience to the whole of this. She's not just worked in the NHS, she's been in the Navy, seen the world and seen a lot and brings a wealth of experience. So tell us more, Suzanne, about what you're doing at Ashford and St Peter's in Northwest Surrey. Um, well, good morning, everybody, and um, thank you very much, Andrew, for inviting me to participate in this morning's discussion. Um, and, and also, it's great to see some of my colleagues from both Surrey and indeed my own organisation participating this morning who, who may well want to add. And I, I've been thinking about how to share our story and listening to Amir is so inspirational. It, it, it kind of are, pro provokes me to go to the end first. So listening to Emir's description of the opportunity that's being created in Bradford, in a way, starts to describe the kind of opportunity that we can see for Ashford and St Peter's, um, whether that be on uh, one of our sites or indeed working into the local community. And the, the range and the scale of the ambition there and the opportunity to create that healthier environment for the local population is really inspiring. And I think it's what's in a way led us to where we are. But I wonder if it's worth just starting with a little bit of um, a story to tell you about us and how we got here. Um, when I became the chief executive at Ashford St Peter's in 2014, Clearly it was my first, uh, uh, well not clearly, but some of you will know it was the first time I was a chief executive. And there was already a strategy rolling for the organization, which in many ways was extremely traditional. The trust was not sustainable. We all knew that, although I have to say, we hadn't really looked underneath of why. We'd done the first order question. We've got too many patients. We don't have enough staff. Cash is short. We have poor infrastructure. Our buildings don't really work for us. But what we do is we pipe them together or add a bit on to try and make room for the patients. We're not efficient. We duplicate. And actually, we don't work with anybody else at all. We try and solve these problems ourselves. And the strategy that was in place to respond to that was very traditional. What do we do? We need to make our hospital bigger, even bigger. We need to join up with another hospital and we need to find a way to do that through a merger, through an acquisition. And indeed, we tried all of those approaches in Surrey. So my trust tried to merge with Frimley, that failed. We tried to acquire Epsom St Helia, that failed. And then finally, we tried to merge with Royal Surrey, that also failed probably for good and proper reasons. But in many ways, because we'd only asked the first order question, we were coming up with a solution that actually wasn't going to fix the problem. We were going to come up with a solution that created bigger hospital infrastructure, more costly, requiring more staff, with the thought that it would generate more income in order to solve our financial problem, and would centralise everything as far as possible into as few locations across Surrey as possible. So that's where I started. And that was the strategy I was asked to, to, to deliver but on and for on behalf of the organisation and the board. And clearly that was failing. Um, the other thing to say for those of you who don't know is that the Surrey is not all the land of milk and honey. Yes, we have a very affluent population. Yes, we have better than average national average health outcomes, but we do have our problems. And it might surprise one or two of you to know that the, there is a life expectancy gap in Surrey of almost 13 years between the richest and the poorest wards. That is one of the biggest health um, inequality gaps in the country, but most colleagues who work in other parts of the country won't be familiar with that. So we had problems that we needed to face and, 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 and address. So we, need, we knew we needed a new strategy, um, but how do you go about that? So we started a period of consultation with the organisation, and this is what is so fascinating about this story, because when we were consulting on our new strategy, guess who we were asking to tell us what needed to happen? the other people in the hospital. <laughs> so our approach to mass consultation was ask all the people we normally work with, very important people, 
very you know key members of the team and we did two years of consultation because the organization has four and a half thousand staff sometimes and we needed to understand what those colleagues and they told us a lot of really important stuff and they told us that what we, they wanted was a strategy that not set out a plan to become the best hospital in the world but a place where we took care of people and we took care of one another and that's what where we started with our together we care strategy and we started even ourselves to think about a shift from services to community we started to use words in our strategy like community although we didn't really know what that meant we, we thought it would be important <laughs> then we had a couple of light bulb moments the first of which I remember very clearly, David Fluck and I were at a seminar of the integrated care system and a slide was put up and it is the um, very familiar to many, the health inequality slide, which pointed out very starkly that clinical care only contributes around 20% to the population's health and well-being. Well, this was a great shock to David and I. I'm a chief executive of a hospital. I've worked in acute hospitals all my life. David's a medical director and an interventional cardiologist. To discover that we weren't the most important contributor to the health and well-being of the population was a great shock. But we took it on board and we also paid attention to what we could see was also contributing to health and well-being. Things like behaviours socioeconomic factors, education, employment, income, family and social support, the community safety and resilience, and all of the other things that contribute. This was a huge moment for us. And we were, hmm, our hospital's got too many patients. Our hospital can't cope. What are we doing to contribute to addressing those health problems? We live in Surrey. We've got the M3, the M25, the A3. If you look at our health activity, it's all around respiratory disease and the, the greater proportion of it in terms of acute care. Well, what's going on with the health, health um, air quality? Are we part of the problem? We started to think to ourselves. If you look at where our hospitals are, our main site is on a motorway roundabout. It is not actually located near a population where people live. People have to get in their car to come to our hospitals. And we were thinking about centralizing everything and building, as we have done, a bigger car park so that people could come to the hospitals. Mm, we thought we, we, we might even be making this problem worse ourselves. Second light bulb moment. We went to one of Andrew's seminars in London where we heard, um, and Nigel, I heard you refer to it earlier, around the sewing rooms. And this struck us as the most amazing thing to see these mature ladies as they were, paying attention to what was going on in the local community and started to do something really creative and innovative themselves. And that what they needed was some support, some enablement, some facilitation, but they knew what to do and they didn't need to be told what to do, but they did need support. And so David and I and the board, we started to have these conversations. Then we had the opportunity to meet with Well North and we were starting to think about how do we make our strategy real? And I think at the time, I very clearly dis remember describing to Andrew, I've got this brilliant strategy. We're starting to understand that we've got a role in creating a healthier community around us, which will both be great for the local community, but will also and importantly address our sustainability issues. Um, but we're starting to lose control of the problem. Um, we, we've, we've sold some land, so we created the opportunity for some capital investment, but the balls are coming over the fence in the form of patients and activity and targets, and this was before we had a pandemic to address with. Um, we, we're just struggling to get a grip of what we need to do. And we started to look at things that were coming out of the health foundation around anchor or institutions and organizations. We started to have a conversation with Andrew and colleagues, and we started to think about our purpose. Could we use the challenge that we had to shift our purpose and at the same time create a new opportunity? Take the capital investment that we had, think about 
what we were doing to contribute to the health and well-being of the local community and think about how to do that differently. Our plan originally had to be to build um, quite traditional new NHS buildings on our site to replace our a &E, which does badly need doing because it's too small. But, but we weren't really being very creative about that. And we also weren't looking outside the organisation. But we knew it would be something important to do. So we took Andrew's offer to work alongside us to start to understand better what was available. And I loved, um, Amir, your app as you walk through a community and you can see what's going on because we just had no clue what was going on in the local community. And this is the work that we've done with Andrew and his colleagues thus far, is to get out into the local community and really listen and look at the detail of what's going on. What activities, what is local business doing? What is the third sector doing? What are other health providers thinking about doing? What are other parts of the public sector doing? And start to look at where we've got opportunities coming. And that's pretty much, I guess, the stage that we're at. Um, we've got some things that we've already done. So we've established a food bank in the hospital, which has been amazingly well supported by the staff. We know from, I mean, there's good evidence, isn't there, that the compassion that um, one shows to one another um, actually enables you to be more resilient in the face of demanding challenge to your own emotional um, coping strategies when looking after people. So this is all really helpful for us to be participating in. Just We've take moved... two more minutes, Suzanne. You've got Thank two you. more minutes. We've moved um, our, the vast majority of our outpatient activity into a local um, uh, co-owned, privately and public sector owned gym, just around the corner from the hospital. But its facilities are um, the sort of facilities that Amir was describing, more um, just a nicer, more uplifting, more inspirational space to be. Um, a great set of gym facilities, great parking, a lovely small cafe. And um, I had a letter from one of the patients who wrote to me to say, um, you've changed my life by putting your outpatient activity in, in the gym because I'm a person who doesn't find leaving the house very easy. Um, I'm a carer for, for a child with some difficulties. And so neither of us leave the house. We don't have a social life. And when you suggested that my outpatient activity took place in this gym, I was really frightened, but I steeled myself and I went and now my son and I have joined the gym. We participate in some of the wider activities um, that the gym and the club, health club offers. And um, we're fitter, happier, our mental health has improved and you've changed our lives. And we had no idea that by moving our outpatient physio activity into a more community-based asset and working in partnership with a local business to do that, that the, 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 the wider benefit would be, would be brought to our patients in that way. And of course our staff love it as well. So that's fantastic. So the work we're going to do over the coming months is to continue to understand what opportunities present and how we can use our opportunity both on the St Peter's site where we've got redevelopment underway to create innovative spaces that create community hub opportunities and start to join up the community in a different way. And we, you know, we might open a restaurant, um, we might open a hotel, we might do lots of things that aren't traditionally what you would put on a hospital site to create a community around the hospital, but not, and this is important, not to draw patients to the hospital, to provide value added community spaces for the people of Weybridge and Chertsey. We will put our health services where people want them and where we can find partnerships to deliver a broader health creation opportunity and i'll leave it there thank you andrew and happy to take any questions thanks suzanne for sharing that that's really great and fantastic and a real incisive view from inside the machinery of the nhs and the realities of running two very large hospitals um, it's a great example of what can be achieved 
under really great leadership. And also what's great, and I have to say this to Suzanne and David Fluck, the medical director, because normally when I've dealt with hospitals around the country, it's often about me controlling everything in the hospital and me having all the budgets and the vested interests of consultants. Actually, it's the medical director, David Fluck, who's leading the conversation about how do we move things out of the hospital into the community. And uh, seeding. No, I, as the chief executive of the hospital, don't need to chair the integrated care partnership. I need to be part of it, but I don't need to control everything. This is a breath of fresh air, a way of thinking about the world that I think we has to be the future, really. It's about collaboration and being honest about who's good at what. So, Suzanne, thank you very much for that. It's really great. I'm now going to hand over to Chris Little, the chairman of HLM Partnership, who's been around all this territory for many, many years and has an in-depth knowledge of buildings and bringing things together. If you can imagine trying to bring together the Army, the Navy and the Air Force and get them to actually work together and share one building, a great building they've designed and built actually, just imagine that and think what was involved to do it. Amazing achievement, just one example of many examples in health and education that Chris and the team have built over the years. What Chris brings is not only a great design sense, but also a proper commercial and practical sense. He's a Yorkshire bloke like me, and he's fed up of hot air like me. He has a sense of getting buildings actually built that make economic sense and that change lives. So to a fellow Yorkshireman, I hand over to Chris. Thanks, Andrew. Um, hopefully that's clear, yes. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to participate today and thanks everyone for joining. Really fantastic presentations so far from the other speakers, which I'm sure will elicit some really interesting questions and uh, uh, debate. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, a few things uh, really this morning using three key examples, two of which are hospitals, and one of which is the Defence Academy, for which uh, I, I was lucky enough to write the brief uh, back in uh, 2000. Um, I think um, what runs through the theme of all that is the concept of deliberate collisions. Deliberate collisions, making things happen for people along the way during their day and deliberate collisions to improve well-being. I think there's real evidence of this and we're going to be talking about that. So the mantra of HLM um, is really thoughtful design to make better places for people. We thought a lot about that and it fits in very well with what's been said um, earlier by the other, other speakers. Um, next, please. Um, I started out my life in, uh, with HLM about, about sort of 40 years ago as a healthcare architect. So I cut my teeth on some uh, fairly major hospital schemes. Um, and one thing that I thought right from the beginning was a difficulty in the um, debate that went around, don't be seen to be spending money on the environment in the hospital, making it right, it should be spent on patients. Back in the day, there was no real understanding looking after staff, looking after the environment, making places that were really beautiful was a really important part of the whole well-being process. We know very differently now, we know differently in all our, our subject areas, that if we look after the people who operate these facilities for people, such as hospitals, look, look after the staff, the patients are going to get the best care. And that's one of the really important elements that we've been uh, continually uh, debating. First example I'm going to talk about, just about to open, which is the Edinburgh Sick Children's Hospital, um, uh, uh, just outside Edinburgh at uh, Petit France. Um, very interesting scheme because it brings together uh, children's maternity and adult services on the same site with a really good proximity to Edinburgh University and the bio quarter. It was also actually procured, um, the first building to be procured under the Scottish government's non-profit distributing model, NPD, which was one of the replacements for the much harangued uh, PFI uh, process. But what I think is important about this scheme is key to the design of the inside of it, which is what is really important to everyone visiting, is the way you collide in terms of the open spaces, the meeting places, the other activities, working with other agencies and everything that we can do like that. I think as well, um, in healthcare, we sometimes forget, especially as architects, that when patients are coming, the level of stress they're under, not least of which starts with finding parking, and Susan, Susan knows all about that down at uh, Ashford and St. Peter's, uh, as many hospitals do. But really that 
that ability to find the entrance, to get inside and to feel that you are still in control as a patient because you know exactly where you're going. Now then, if you've got staff working in those spaces and the deliberate collisions, as I call them, are informative in terms of wayfinding and well-being, you are really getting towards making people and places better by the way you organize the space. Next one, please. Um, a great example of that as well is uh, in London, Derry. Many of you will remember the uh, event, uh, Bloody Sunday, back in the Troubles, where the Alton Gelvin Hospital, the Tower Block, was where everyone was, was taken um, after that um, sad uh, episode. Um, and um, we won the competition to rebuild the new hospital, uh, about 143 million, um, about uh, 15 years ago. Um, and we've been working there ever since. And the point about these slides really um, are about what do, what do buildings look like you know, to other people? Is a hospital a scary magnolia painted, green painted sort of place to be? Well, of course it's not, we know about that now, but there are inspiration spaces um, that you can actually create at both outside and inside the buildings. And I think these slides really start to show that the incorporation of art, of light, both in the daytime and at night when you're entering spaces and coming in can be really, really important. This uh, particular project um, has attracted um, quite a, a good amount of, um, of architectural um, um, accolade in terms of its awards, but that's not really the point. The point is when you're moving through the space, it's flooded with light and air and outside spaces. Next one, please. And the courtyard areas, the way that we've used art, the way that we've, we've, we've been able to work with uh, local artists who are now, as part of the community, starting to use these sort of spaces as well has been extremely, extremely important. So those two examples of where I'd like to think that deliberate collisions to improve well-being, to improve that feeling of being in control, and to pay respect to the staff in those hospitals who really make the space work for its patients, are really important elements. Now, having been a healthcare architect for many years in my, my career, I now also lead the defense sector and the justice sector. So you can imagine in terms of the new prison program um, at the moment, how challenging that is. Uh, and both Lord uh, Crisp and I and Lord Morrison have spoken about these uh, challenges uh, previously on a number of occasions. And hopefully some of the building typologies that are now coming out start to aid well-being in a prison circumstance, which is part of the um, rehabilitation and the recovery uh, process. But in defense, it is even more complicated. So if you, if you just move on to the next slide, please. Um, the Royal Navy, the Senior Service, the Army and the Royal Air Force are our three services which make up our defense capability. They're quite diverse. The Royal Navy has been around for uh, hundreds of years. Uh, and the RAF for 102 years. So you can imagine the differences in heritage and ethos are fairly significant. Following the Falklands War um, and the, um, the theater activities to see how people in the various services could work better together in a command structure, it was decided to create the Joint Services Command and Staff College, the Defense Academy, um, to create a facility, a college, where the state of the art um, teaching and um, war gaming activities could take place to get people from different services to work closely together. Next one, please. Now, this was, um, next one, please. This was uh, quite a challenge. There's, the, there's an aerial view of the, of the building and there's the plan. Quite a challenge because um, the Royal Air Force were coming with their ethos and history from um, Bracknell, the army from the Army College at uh, Camberley and the Royal Navy from the most wonderful buildings, including the Painted Hall down at uh, Greenwich. So to bring people together with those heritages and history in one facility was quite a, quite a challenge. Um, hopefully you can see on the plan there, um, a, a curved internal street at the bottom of the drawing. And that was really designed to be the working street during the day to enable people to move from their accommodation through to the central facilities and through to the um, uh, classroom and teaching areas via 
a library which was critically important in defense because it had 27 kilometers of shelving and was the largest outside the Pentagon. The in central the area, which is purple there, is the, uh, is the forum. And um, that's where people meet for coffee and tea designed by us uh, and the design team on a daily basis. But the street itself created collisions, it created meetings, it created people in different sort of uniforms. And now there's 70 countries from all over the world uh, study there from all of the uh, services. And it created a feeling of working together by the way the building developed the collisions across its route and across the daily life. And I think whilst it's not a healthcare example, it is nice to see, I think, for all of us, a debate around the commonality of this making people and places better and how different buildings in different areas can really contribute uh, to that. Central, of course, to this endeavor and the success was working closely with the Ministry of, of Defense and its advisors and the Chief of the Defense Staff who, through their, again, staff, far-sighted vision of what they wanted to achieve were able to really inform the brief. So I hope those three examples in terms of making people and places better and using different building uh, typologies will inspire some further discussion with this idea of deliberate collisions to improve well-being and connectivity at the heart of it. Andrew, thank you. Thank you, Chris, that's really great. And thanks for a very clear demonstration of the crucial role innovation design plays in, in, in creating healthy places, healthy hubs really, and connect communities is a great illustration, really. And, and just to say, having listened to those presentations, um, we at the moment, government is talking about 44 new hospitals, actually, and in the Sir Robert Naylor's review, actually. And, and I'm talking now on a monthly basis with Sir Robert Naylor and with uh, Dr. Sam Evington about this whole question about if what Chris and Suzanne and colleagues are saying about is the future of health, what is a hospital in this a world we're now in in this century how do we prevent the civil service building buildings that are last century rather than this what are the implications of all of that and i'm now going to bring suzanne and others into that conversation that is already beginning about this major piece of investment about what is the future of hospitals and what is the future of health in the community how do we have a more joined up vision and this conversation of course is beginning to articulate what some of that might come to mean so it's been really great um, to listen to these real experts with real long hard experience in the real world of these issues so thanks very much just before we go on to the q a though it's very interesting i thought we just open up one little experience for you so when we started with suzanne david fluck and the team at ashford st peter's and members of the community senior people in, in northwest surrey to look at the future of the hospital and the culture of the hospital and the way the nhs thinks there was a really fascinating debate that occurred between suzanne and her team and the policy coming down the line from the NHS and Chris from a business perspective about what really uh, matters if you're really going to create these transformational cultures. The policy was um, patient first. Seems obvious, seems logical. Patients first. Chris began to say no, 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 no. If you want to really build a successful organisation, it must be staff first. Staff must be the thing that matters. So I thought I might just hand over to Suzanne first and then Chris to just engage, open up that little debate we had in that first encounter mm -hmm. around some of these issues. So Suzanne, what did that feel? Tell me what life, what you were being told by the NHS and how you saw it at the time. Uh, well, that's really, I mean, it is really interesting, Andrew. And I think it wasn't so much what we were being told by the NHS. It was really what we'd decided as leaders of the organization and it, it goes back to what we spoke about earlier purpose what what was our purpose and we felt and, and it will have been informed by the policy context we were operating with and within and our experience today but we felt our purpose was to deliver the very best patient care at the very highest quality with the very highest experience and outcomes and of course that's not wrong that's completely yeah. <laughs> completely right <laughs> and we did know we knew very well that the experience of our team was 
probably the most significant contributor to that success, if that's what we were going to achieve. We knew, we did know that. And the board were very clear about that. Um, and, and I think actually David and I were particularly, had been quite, quite, you know, well challenged by the board about actually, is that the right way? Is it, is it right for you to place the patients preeminent to the team? Um, and I think David and I particularly were very convicted in that place. No, this is our purpose. We're acute care clinicians. This is what we do. This is the purpose of this building. This is the purpose of this team. And without our purpose, there is no hospital, there is no team. Um, and so we'd actually stuck to our guns on that quite, <laughs> quite firmly for quite a long time. And when we had the conversation uh, after we, we'd held some, you, you had facilitated and your colleagues mm. with us, Andrew, your team, we'd had some sort of stakeholder, big stakeholder engagement at listening events and discussion events, hadn't we? Yeah. And then you brought us together with Chris to sort of bring the product of those conversations together with the thinking we were having about what are we going to build <laughs> broadly <laughs> and where are we going to build it? And... We were, we were just at the beginning of that conversation and, and, and David and I were presenting the trust strategy with the support of Andy Field and other non-executives. And, and that's when Chris sort of stopped us and said, have you got that right? Is it right for you to place the pre patients preeminently above all else? Which in many well ways then kind of to create um, a sense of direction of travel, which is if you like, the operating theatre is always going to be more important, um, as clearly as important as that is, um, as, as creating a space for your team to work, to be most efficient, to be most um, effective, to, to thrive and to um, develop. And um, Chris might want to pick up the story, but he, <laughs> he was very challenging to David and I around that and said, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that that's right. And you need to really have a think about that. And I would say the product of the conversations we've had internally and subsequently, and I would also say very heavily informed by the experience we've had through the pandemic, um, is that you do, you I wouldn't say that we've gone as far as to place the staff and the team above the patients, but we very clearly brought them onto a, a more a more equitable position in our thinking. Both both are as important, and there's a synergy, a yin and a yang there that 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 they are completely um, the sides of the of the coin. Um, mm -hmm. Because Suzanne, that's really really interesting. I'm going to bring Chris in here because all of us have been listening for too many years to a ridiculous conversation out there about the private sector and the NHS that sheds no light. Um, you know, it's a, you know another manic monologue. I remember Dennis Healy in the Libyan crisis many years ago saying, we've heard another manic monologue which sheds as much light as an electric drill. And I listened to a lot of that in the NHS and in our politicians. But actually what you had here was a real encounter between private sector experience public sector experience and the actually creative opportunity in the middle of all of that. So Chris, tell us about your experience of running a major oh, yeah, successful yeah. business about that question. The, the classic example, of course, I remember the first neuro theatres that I did. Uh, neurosurgery uh, and brain surgery can be a very long process. Some, some episodes can last up to 12 hours, uh, you know, sort of 10 hours with the top of your head open. And if you're working hard in that kind of stressful environment, what becomes very important is to leave the patient into and go into a separate area where you can take some time out, uh, maybe have some uh, refreshment and go back in and start again. So if there's ever a great example of being able to look in after staff, complex theatre teams and so on, it's in that breakout space relative to very long procedures. And I'm sure everyone can understand that. But perhaps the second example, which is not about really putting staff first, it's, it's about respecting totally respecting the key role that staff have in creating the best patient care. That's what it's all about. Mm. Now, um, just walk down the street, just walk outside after this, just look at all the signs on the wall thanking the NHS because of what all the staff have been doing during the current uh, pandemic. If there's ever a better example right now of the country understanding how important that is, I mean, you couldn't have, we couldn't have predicted at our immersion workshop late last year that all this was going to happen. I wish we could, I wish it hadn't happened, 
But my goodness me, what a great example that is, front and center of how important it is to respect the people who are providing the care, look after them in order for the patients to get the best care. It is that simple. And Nigel, how do you, you were in charge of the NHS when some of these discussions were going on, and how does it look when you're really at the top of a very big system with lots of political pressure from doctors and all sorts of people? Well, uh, interesting conversation, isn't it? And, and I think a very helpful one. Um, there's a bit of a distinction here between the purpose and how you do it, of course. Um, and the purpose is, as Suzanne very clearly said, is it's about health and the patients, isn't it? Um, but the reason this became so significant in the NHS, I think sort of 20, 30 years ago, um, was very much around the fact that too often health services seem to be organized around the convenience of staff. Yeah. Um, and, and that's true of the back. I remember, you know, running the Oxford Teaching Hospitals and, and having rows with people about how the services needed to be provided for the convenience of the patients and yeah. not because somebody happened to have a, another deal with some other hospital somewhere else or whatever. And I, I think anyone who's been around the NHS will know exactly what I'm talking about there. So that was the political drive. And, and it was all part, it was from the private sector, of course, it was putting the customer first, if you want to put it another way around. You know, that's, yeah. that's the purpose. However, that has been used by some politicians to beat up staff. Uh, and they've used it in a very negative way. But Chris's point is fantastically important, isn't it? Um, I know that there is a, an expression around the NHS now that I've heard, which is care in equals care out. Um, and that if you provide care for your, uh, there's evidence that the more that you care for, make people feel part of wanting to be motivated, et cetera, et cetera, um, the more better they are at providing care. So I think that's, it, it is both of these things, but it is partly the purpose and partly the how. And and I, I'm sorry to come in, Nigel, but the thing that we were struggling with was on a constrained site with constrained yeah. resources, how do you prioritise the creation of space that's needed for therapy and treatment in the way that Chris was challenging us, you know, and that is why we needed creative architectural support, actually, to say, well, look at your space differently. You've got the opportunity. So, we had the desire, but we didn't think we had the space and the opportunity to, pre to, 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 to deliver it in that way. And actually what we needed was some expertise to say, ah, oh, but what are you doing with your roof space? Or <laughs> what, what are you doing with that huge space that looks like an amphitheater that's a car park, you know? And actually we haven't followed everything exactly, but it's given us the opportunity to think about it differently. And I think that's, that's been the real sort of surprise to us. We were like, goodness me, we would never, ever have thought, we would just never, and we just thought, no, we have to prioritise the operating theatres over the, the, the team facilities because there just isn't space to do, to have but, any other alternative. Let, let, let me come back on that. I mean, that's one of the great issues of, of, of advantage of having external challenge, isn't it? Yeah. Let, let me, very briefly, Andrew, if I may, just t tell you one, one story. One minute, yeah, one minute. Yeah, minute. But... Um, when I was chief executive of the NHS, I obviously had a lot of trusts and, and, and NHS bodies accounting to me. The ones that got into trouble were the ones who, when they got into trouble, uh, the ones who had real trouble, when they got into trouble, they went into um, siege mentality. They turned in on themselves. They locked themselves in their office. They didn't talk to people. The ones who got who did well were the people who got into trouble because you're all going to get into trouble, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Organisation. None of this is without problems. This is one of the hardest jobs in the world you've got, Suzanne, um, and, and 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 your colleagues. Um, is when you deal with it, you you reach for a friend. You, yeah. you go outside. You look for other solutions. You you open out. It's harder to do because the yeah. temptation is to say, "Oh God," and hide in the office if you see what I mean, but actually going outside and working with others and getting the challenge of great people like Chris or, 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 yeah. or in your patients or, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So what I wanted to do just in that little spot was give people a feel about what happens when you create a really creative environment actually for health, where there's that kind of open dialogue and encounter and all of those things. And how this is what have you just given you is a 360 degree view there of an issue actually from the very top from a local setting from a public sector point of view a business experience point of view and actually what comes starts to come out of it as you can probably feel is a really creative solution and way of thinking this is 
to do with the future culture of health that we need to try and create actually mm -hmm. that breaks open all these ridiculous ideologies and these silos and creates a creative encounter between real experts that ultimately will benefit the patient and the community hopefully you got a bit of a sense of that from that one issue but thank you nigel amir suzanne and chris for sharing your inspiring and thought-provoking ideas and for the book nigel which i think has triggered a real debate uh, your insight experience of fresh thinking has given us plenty to reflect on in my case certainly much greater optimism about the future i think you can feel it in this conversation about what the future might could become really and thanks also to the audience for taking part many colleagues i can see on the list with great experience in the machinery and out in the systems and i know many people longing to join the dots and build this new environment my thoughts are let's be ambitious and turn the challenges we undoubtedly face into opportunities to do things differently. With an entrepreneurial mindset and a commitment to joining the dots, we can lead the way on replacing the traditional approaches to improving health. Achieving sustainable change is all about taking a locally led and focused approach to making people and places better. And of course, we're very happy to continue the conversation outside this forum. Please do feel you can get in touch with us at Well North. Our um, email address is enquiries at wellnorthenterprises.co.uk. And Suzanne and Nigel and Chris and I and other colleagues look forward very much to taking this whole conversation, national really, and into other forums and other places to stimulate a debate and, and, and conversation about the real practical world and how we create a new environment, a new narrative around the health of the nation. Thank you very much.